Hey guys, welcome in. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Monday's Live. Monday is here. Hopefully you guys all had a good work day, if that's what you had to do today. If you had, if you had to work, hopefully it was a good work day. But we're all back. We're all back for our second Missing Monday series. So um, we're gonna. this is a series that we're starting on the channel. We were going to do it through the month of December, and if it goes well, we'll, we'll keep doing it. So I think we'll keep on doing it. So welcome in, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate it. This one's a really important case to me, so I appreciate you guys all being here. I know a lot of people may have not have, may have never heard of this case before because it, it is an older one, but it's really important that we still continue to talk about it. So, um, and there is a really good documentary out on this case. I'll have to um, figure out if I can figure out a free way for you guys to watch it if you don't have Oxygen Channel, because for some reason. They have, um, they have a really good video on oxygen, but I heard from, um, I was watching a bunch of like, you know, little podcasts to get ready for tonight. And I heard from Kendall Ray that she was all kinds mad. She was so mad at oxygen channel and like the people that had the clips because there were certain clips that they're, they're nowhere. They're, they're scrubbed from the internet. They're not on the internet anywhere. And you can only watch them if you watch that documentary. And she was really upset about that because of the fact that it's a missing person. And, you know, she's like, as the true crime community, we should all be working together when it comes to missing, especially a missing person's case. Um, you know, I mean, you want to get the, the story out there. So um, she was really upset. And so I've been looking everywhere because there's a, there was a video of um, the girl that we're going to talk about tonight, which is Phoenix Colden. And there was a video of her and I wanted to show it to you guys, but I still can't find it. So that's okay. I'm just going to tell you what it says. If I can't, if I can't get it up for you guys, um, I was going to like play it and then like record it. I don't know. I was gonna try to do something funny with it. <laughs> so you guys could hear that part because it was really good, but I did find a podcast, um, that should be fine to play and I'll have some pictures and stuff up of her. And I did have the picture up of her here whenever we started the live today. So, and before we kind of get started, I want to say hi to everybody. Welcome on in, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. And if this is your first time here, I'm Tanya or Titanium Built. You can call me either or. Either or. And if you guys don't mind just uh, hitting the like button, that'd be great. That'd be great. That'll get us out into the algorithm. Get us out there. Hey, Holly. And hey, I saw Jan was in here and Alicia and Cheryl. She's always here. She's my girl. Steve. <laughs> hey, Steve. How you doing today? Doing good? I was like, where'd the comment go? I just saw it. And then Ashley, we haven't seen you in a while, Ashley. She said her family's been here and then she heard her back. I, I was reading your comment earlier. I was like, oh my gosh, you hurt your back. Hey, Aldo. Hey, Catherine. I saw Teresa's in here. Oh, we got everybody. Aggie. Hey, Aggie. Come in. If I missed you, I am so sorry. If I did, just yell at me. I said I'll hi to Alicia, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> and Stephanie's there. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys all for being here. I appreciate it. So I'm going to um, read a little bit on the missing persons flyer. And then I have... Um, like a whole word document that I put together. It'll give this, the, it'll cover the whole case. And then before I get into like the word document, I did find a small clip of when her parents first was talking to CNN when she first was missing. So she's been missing, like I said, since December of 2011. So it's been a really long time. I wasn't familiar with this case until 2018 when that documentary came out on Oxygen Channel. And ever since then, I've just been really like, um, I don't want to say obsessed, but you know, I'm checking all like, I'm checking like every six months, you know, I'm like, I'm on it. Like I'm not on, on it. Cause I mean, there's nothing ever really coming out, but if every six months I'm checking to see if like, you know, um, just anything's come out over her, if they've, you know, the parents have found anything, police have found anything, if they released anything that they have in their possession, cause they're keeping a lot of stuff, you know, tight to the vest. Um, and there just hasn't been anything out on her. So I wanted to cover the story, get her name out there again. She's such a pretty girl. Um, so she was last seen on December the 18th of 2011 in Spanish Lake, St. Louis, Missouri. So, um, she lived right outside of St. Louis. And if you have any information, you can always contact the St. Louis police department at 314-615-5317. Um, she is 23 years old and I did have... Um, I should have had a better flyer. Let me see. I was like, I had like 15 of them pulled up. 
And this is the only one that didn't have like her height and all that stuff on there. So she's, um, these are like so hard to read. I think it's because it's Facebook, but she is, there we go. Let me put this one up. This one might be better. There we go. Um, she was 23. She's 5'6", 125, black hair, black eyes. And she was wearing the day that she, you know, went missing a black hooded sweatshirt, gray sweatpants with Lindenwood or UMSL on the leg, black sneakers, and she has pierced ears. And she may wear glasses, um, but they did find her glasses in her vehicle. So they, and we'll get to that. So, um, and here it says Phoenix was last seen sitting in her car at her home in um, unincorporated North St. Louis and was seen driving away around 3 p.m. Her parents thought she was going to the store or to a friend's house. Later that day, her car was found abandoned, still running at an intersection about 25 minutes from her home on St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, Illinois. I don't know what size Illinois. That's not right. Um, Minnesota, sorry. Um, the police had the car towed, not knowing it was hers. So when they found her car, the door was open, the keys were in the ignition, it was on, and there was just there was no Phoenix to be seen. And they found her car. Her parents reported her missing, um, I think pretty quickly. Like they know, you know, but they didn't um like they thought that she was with a friend. So when they reported her that evening, when the cops went to check the database to see if there was anything on, you know, in there, and it should have been like, hey, we found this vehicle at 530 abandoned on the road with the keys. Um, it didn't come back because that officer hadn't put in that report yet. So there was just a miss there. So, well, welcome to the, well, welcome to the being a member, Tawny. Welcome to the Titan crew here. Thank you so much. Welcome. <laughs> Something got her, yeah, something got her attention or, well, where she stopped also, it's in East um, St. Louis, so it's just really bad area, and it is right off of Highway 70, I believe it's called, so it's Interstate 70, and it's a big trafficking um, interstate right there, so there's like, and there's so many different twists and turns to this story, because her parents came out, and um, and you'll, you'll see them in a moment, and at first you thought, okay, this girl is, um, by the book, goes to church, goes to school, lives with her parents, but then she almost had like a second life and we'll go through that too. So it's like, there's just so many twists and turns to this one. I feel like, um, let me show you this video. Cause that'll kind of get you guys an idea of what's going on. And then I'm going to go over, um, like a little bit of everything, you know, the disappearance, the theories, the sightings, the potential sightings, um, and just a little bit of her background that I was able to gather from some, some, rep some reports today. And, um, yeah, I'm um, hopefully we can get, we can get that for you. Um, Juju, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Well, welcome. Welcome on in. Come on in. We're glad to have you. <laughs> So um, this is going to be her parents. And this was back from, this was 10 years ago. Let me see if it'll show the date, like the exact date. So this was May 13th, 2013. So this was actually two years after she disappeared. And that's so crazy because nobody picked up this case when she disappeared. Nobody, but like one reporter from one news station. And they really just took, you know, on the case. And so it's really hard to find information on this case. And I'm hoping, hoping <laughs> maybe this video will get out there and help a little bit. So, um, cause you know, you just never, you never know where people could be. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and play this for you guys. And if you guys don't mind just hitting the like button, it really helps the channel and it'll get this video out. Only a week before Christmas in 2011, when 23-year-old Phoenix Colden got into her black Chevy and drove away from her house in St. Louis County, Missouri. Her parents say they thought she was just going to the store, but Phoenix never came back. She's been missing for nearly a year and a half. She backed out of the driveway and we never saw her again. Three hours after Phoenix drove off, her black Chevy was impounded by police. It was found 25 minutes away from Phoenix's house. The car was empty, the motor still running. The driver's side door was open. I need to see Phoenix. I need to, I need to hug her. She needs to come home. 
Phoenix is a college student at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. She plays the piano and guitar and is a regional champion fencer. Her parents say she's the type of young woman to always call to let them know where she is. They firmly believe she's alive. Phoenix's parents continue to ask the public to phone in any tips or information on Phoenix's whereabouts. If someone calls, that's another spark of hope that we have, uh, that we're going to find our daughter alive. And that spark is something that keeps you alive. That spark of hope is keeping them alive. Phoenix's parents, Goldie and Lawrence Golden, uh, join me now. Thanks for being here. Thank you for it's hard allowing to, us. It's hard for you to even see that, isn't it? Yes, it is very hard, especially the part where they were searching. And I told them, I told them before that Phoenix is not laying in nobody's weeds. She's not. You still have her bed made? You still have the Christmas tree mm -hmm. up? I understand. We still have. We oh. rearranged her room so she'd have more room. Um, her room was a little messy? No, it's not now. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that I was going to say her mama cleaned her room because that's what my mom would do. Like my mom did that actually once when I moved out when I was 19 and I moved back in two weeks later, I was like, I'm coming home. But you know, you do that for, you know, when you have like a missing child, some, some, some parents, they don't change the room at all, but other parents, you know, they tidy it and they get it clean and they almost get it to where like it's welcoming back them back. And so, you know, um, that's just really sad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the Christmas tree is still up. The original lights burned out because I keep the lights on day and night. So I put more lights on the tree. You know, Lawrence, we, we learned a lot about missed opportunities this past week with mm -hmm. the cases in Cleveland. Okay. Talk about missed opportunities. The police, they found her vehicle nearby, but you didn't, nobody yeah. told you about it for what, two weeks? Two weeks before we found out where the vehicle was and the East St. Louis police had uh, had the vehicle towed to the impound yard uh, probably three hours after she went missing. Um, I, I understand that in a situation <clears throat> like that, the police should determine who the vehicle belongs to and notify the county where the vehicle is registered so that they can uh, contact the people who, who own the vehicle. And that wasn't done. So we lost two weeks of in investigative time trying to find our daughter and we didn't know where the vehicle was. Two critical weeks, John. Initially, those moments and those hours are so crucial, Anderson. And they, everything, this beautiful, accomplished girl fell through the cracks literally and disappeared off the face. And, and I got to say, just in mm -hmm. terms of sort of getting media attention, which is also critical early on in a case like this, oftentimes the media focuses on, uh, you know, on not on African-American mm -hmm. people who are missing. Blonde, blonde little boy with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Smart, blonde girl from a big home, try to fight with the media. And we're in the media. There's a responsibility. We, we America's most wanted. We don't care what color you are, but black kids stay on the news cycle for about a day, maybe, and then they fall off the news cycle. Hispanic kids are on for and two you've hours. Seen that I, I have, and I, I've been yeah. very vocal about it. I didn't even know he was actually in that clip. I didn't notice it when I was. Um, listening to it earlier. I must not have listened to that part with, with him <laughs> or something. That's really weird. I didn't know that John Walsh was, um, I guess, helping them maybe. If anybody can find somebody, it's that guy. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. So I'll move it over to here because this will be a little bit of the backstory. And then we'll watch, we'll listen to a podcast. And then I have some pictures I could put up of Phoenix. Um, so basically what we're going to do is just, I'm going to give you guys some background to the story, um, the theories they have out there, because she almost was kind of living a double life. Um, her parents were, they're very sweet in that video. Um, and I'm not saying they're not sweet. They're very, they're, they are very nice people. Um, but there were, they were very um, strict and not just like a little bit strict, like um, were pretty pretty, pretty, pretty strict. Like she was homeschooled. She was one of those kids that she was like homeschooled. She went to church. Like her life was very structured and that's good, but she was an adult at that point. Like, so, um, I think it was just a little bit of, she wanted a little bit more freedom at times and she wasn't getting that with her parents. Um, 
And it's just, it's really, this case is really sad. And you guys will understand more whenever I read on through all this stuff. So it's not like a whole lot, but, um, but it, and, it's, and it's big printed. <laughs> I printed it big. Um, so this is the disappearance of Phoenix, Phoenix Colden. Um, Phoenix Lucille Colden was born. Um, actually, you know what? Let me put this up while I'm just like talking about her. And then, you know, I'll um, put it back onto this whenever we get to the, the disappearance part. So um, Phoenix Lucille Colden was born on the 25th of May, 1988 to Goldia Reeves. When Phoenix was a child, Goldia met Lawrence Golden and they got married and moved to Spanish Lake, Missouri, where Phoenix grew up. Her parents were described by friends as being very strict. Goldia and Lawrence brought their daughter up to be a very religious and homeschooled Phoenix from the fifth grade onwards. Phoenix did well in school and excelled in music and sports, becoming a local junior fencing champion. By all accounts, Phoenix was polite, hardworking, and well-adjusted, if a bit sheltered by her parents. Um, in 2007, Phoenix began attending the University of Missouri and moved into an apartment that her parents paid for. At this point, Phoenix began leading a very different life. And then I'll, I'm going to put it back over on the document now so you guys can kind of read around with me. Um, so it says, um, at this point, Phoenix began leading a very different life, one which she hid from her parents. And this is all like um, from the documentary, from the Oxygen documentary, because the two people that were doing like the investigation for the documentary, they were able to talk to one of her best friend, well, her best friend, Akira. And they got a whole ton of new information just by interviewing her that, that they didn't know prior. So um, I don't know what, oh, I'm, I guess I messed that up there. So it says um, she began dating a guy named Michael B. She told her parents she was living with a female friend, but in reality, Michael had moved into the apartment. Phoenix was disagreeing with her parents more and began dating another man referred to as cell phone Mike using a second phone. So she was living with her live-in boyfriend, Mike B. That's what the names were and under the phone. So that's what we know them as. Um, and then the other guy that she started dating was named cell phone Mike. Now her parents didn't know that um, she had a boyfriend. They didn't know that she was dating or any of that. So this, they were like shocked when they... <laughs> When they heard this, they were really, really shocked. I was like, you know, she's an adult. <laughs> I don't know. I, but they were. Um, it, it was almost like they they didn't know some of, like a lot about her. You know, like maybe she didn't want to tell them some things. She Maybe she was doing some, you know, maybe this Michael B or the cell phone Mike. Maybe they were not very good people. And... She didn't want her parents to, um, you know, know who they were. And because um, she also used to go out to her car and make telephone calls. And I mean, I, I never have to make a phone call in my car. And if I did, that would it probably mean I'm like trying to hide something, you know, like you don't want someone to overhear what you're saying. So you go out to your car, you know, so you have a little bit more, you know, a little bit more um, privacy. Oh, Asa, that would be great. I was just, I was just thinking of him right before the live. If you want, you will you email me. It's Titanium Built Boo. Um, I'll I'll put the email thing in there. I would love to know, and I know Jan would love to know too, because <laughs> she's the one that brought it to me. My mod. Yeah, definitely. Let me know. Uh, hey, Aries. I was looking. I didn't look at the iPad. Thanks for coming in, guys. Um, so then in 2011, Goldia broke the news to her daughter that they couldn't pay for the expenses of her apartment anymore, and she would have to move back home. Now, I'm wondering if mom had an inkling that something was going on at college. I don't know. Because I'm just, I, I don't, I just have a feeling at this point, Phoenix's mental health issues seemed to worsen. She began fighting with her parents more and started expressing feelings of paranoia. She told her friend Akira she felt someone was following her and friends of Phoenix 
stated they believe she was hiding something from them and wasn't acting her usual self. She told another friend that she never enrolled in the upcoming semester of university. Now, I'm wondering if her parents found out about that somehow or if they were checking her phone records because she had a phone with them. And back in 2011, they would show you like the full call logs, like, you know, in out in out or in and out phone calls. Like, I think that they were a little more where you um, would get that on like a paper copy where you could call the numbers back. It was a little easier. But, um, oh, we're having a migraine, Brandy White. Oh, no. She used her members batch or little member thing to do that. Thank you for doing that. Congratulations on your little milestone. I love it. I love it. Four months. I love that. Hmm. So let's see. Um, she said, it says here, she told her friend that she never enrolled in the upcoming semester at the university. And then after a fight with Akira in her car, Phoenix pulled out a knife. And then this was in the interview. And this is though Akira says she never intended to hurt her before her disappearance. Phoenix filmed a video in her car where she seems visibly distressed. The, the video is so sad. I wish I could show it to you guys. I cannot find that stinking video. Um, anywhere. I wonder if I went through like the, I'm about to get on the oxygen thing and figure that out. If, if I can, if I can do that on the oxygen app, I'll, um, just not monetize it and do like a video short or something to where if it, I hope they don't just copyright strike me though. Cause that's really important to this case. Um, she was very distressed in the video. She talks about wanting to start over, but Phil, she can't, she recites the serenity prayer she also talks about how she just wants to be happy and she's never felt happy before. I think her exact words were like, I can't remember a time where I actually felt happy. And like the video, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart because you see somebody just really sad. So this is the disappearance. Um, so to Goldia Colden, the 18th of December, 2011 was a regular Sunday. She and her daughter went to church in the morning. After the service, Phoenix stayed in her car while her parents were inside. Um, she called Michael B. 10 times, like in the car, as her parents were inside the home. At 2.30 p.m., Lawrence saw Phoenix get into her 1998 Chevy Blazer, assuming she was taking a trip to the store to see her friends or to see her friends. Now, let's just, it's cold even too. Like it's December, middle of December, has to be cold. Like, don't you think? I guess her parents, I mean, they, they were, they weren't, I mean, they were overbearing, but I mean, you know, she, she could always go to her car. It's just weird that they wouldn't be like, stay inside. Don't run out your gas or something. You know what I mean? Like that. You've seen it, Aggie. You've seen it. And she starts crying. Yeah. It's, I wish I could show it to you. I, I need to find that video. It, it just, she looks so sad. So then it's almost like it, cause like, we'll get to the theories in a minute. Cause then it's like, well, maybe she left on her own and she's like happy. It makes you want to think that way. Um, it says this would be the last time Phoenix parents would see their daughter at 527. Phoenix's car was found by the police in East St. Louis. Police searched her car and found several items belonging to Phoenix, but there was no sign of where she had gone. She had seemingly vanished into thin air. Now in the podcast, you'll hear this that um, Goldia got a police report and I've been trying to find them too. I'm going to FOIA the crap out of those. Um, so she got a police report back in like 2011 or something, right when this happened, right after, you know, it happened, she got a police report and it said that Phoenix's car was empty. There was nothing in her vehicle when they found it. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, I was in the I was in the shower listening to it, and I'm like, wait a minute, she's a girl. Like that's what popped in my head because I was trying to refresh, you know, my memory on the case. And as soon as I said that, they were like, um, there ended up being another police report coming out two years later that said that there was a bunch of stuff left in her car, like her purse, um, like a tote bag or like a bag of some sort. Nothing like that to where she was like packing to leave, um, but just like a scarf, like random things that women have in their car. We all have clothes in our car or a shoe couple pairs of shoes, you know, I mean, if you guys don't, then I must be the weird one, <laughs> but I swear it. I put like a little something in there every time I go and I leave it in there. I got blanket in there. got a pillow, you know, the necessities, but they, um, they did find stuff in there. So, 
So 12 years later, there is still no official confirmation of what happened to Phoenix Colden. After her disappearance, Phoenix bank account and cell phone were never activated and she has never, and she has not contacted her family or friends in that time. While there have been allegate, um, I'm sorry, alleged sightings of Phoenix, where she went or what happened to her that day is still involved with very few leads. So there was a couple potential sightings, um, only a couple. Like, it's crazy that, you know, it's been 12 years, two sightings, potential sightings. But the one, the first one is a pretty credible now. It says um, <clears throat> here, while Phoenix seems to have disappeared without a trace, there have been possible sightings from of her from different eyewitnesses. One of them was from a friend of Phoenix's. So this is a friend of hers. They went to church together. Um, so I feel like this is pretty credible because she was at church every Sunday. She went on Wednesdays. She did like the bells um, and stuff, you know, like ring the bells for the church. So she was known in the church. Um, this is three years after her car was found. Kelly Von Hart claimed to have seen Phoenix at the airport boarding the same flight as her from Las Vegas to St. Louis. Kelly called out Phoenix's name and the woman or when the woman walked by. According to Kelly, the woman on the plane turned to her when she called out, though when asked by Kelly, she said she didn't know who Phoenix was. The woman walked away and got into her seat after that. Kelly also mentioned the woman was on the flight with three or four women who seemed to be of similar age and appearance, as well as two men who Kelly described as being similar to pro football players in build. After the flight, Kelly went to board, went to um, airport security and the police were called, but they were unable to locate the women and no one had come forward about the sighting. So, in that sighting, it looked almost like maybe, maybe a trafficking kind of a deal because all of the girls, um, it doesn't say it here, but all of the girls were around the same age. They looked the same. They were dressed similar. All of the, the men that were with them were really big guys. I guess they were dressed kind of like, um, suits and ties, almost like body, like not bodybuilders, but like, um, security or something like along those lines. Now, I don't know if they dress like that. When they traffic people or not on an airplane, but that's how they were dressed. And that's what I took from that. And that's what a lot of people took from that sighting was a possible trafficking situation. And, you know, because when she called her name, she looked behind her. But now if you're the only one boarding, let's say they were the last to board and someone hollers out someone's name, you're going to turn around probably, you know, I mean, they'll be like, who are they talking to? So it could have been one of those also, so. Um, but the second sighting was Jeff Har Hargrove, a friend of Phoenix's uncle, David Scott, who claimed he had seen Phoenix twice. Both times were in St. Louis, where Phoenix's car was found. According to Jeffrey, both of these sightings occurred in 2014, three years after she was reported missing. Jeffrey says he saw her in a grocery store and they talked. He asked her if she was related to David. Jeffrey claims the woman neither conformed nor de denied the relationship and seemed reluctant to confirm anything to him. Why didn't he call the police right then and there? I don't know. He said the woman didn't seem interested in the conversation and described her as being standoffish. Jeffrey told Goldia, Goldia of this sighting, although she, he also said he got the impression that if this was Phoenix, she didn't want to be found. Again, no one has come forward with this sighting. You think so? Trafficking? I think my chair is going down. Like, <laughs> I need to pull it up a little bit. Um, no, I'm thinking I, that's what I'm thinking that too. I really am. Because, I mean, her car was or a robbery or something gone wrong. She, she was in a really bad part of St. Louis. And I guess it's like part of, it's like a hub for doing that kind of stuff. But it's also probably a hub for theft and all of that kind of stuff. Carjackings and so just crazy. I know I do need to get a new one. I do. I do, Cheryl. I really do need to get a new chair. One of these days. I, I forget about it when I stand up. You know what I mean? Like once I leave the room, I forget until I sit back down and I'm like, I swear this chair is going down. <laughs> you guys are just going to see me going boop, boop, boop. Um, I like, I like the 
the style of this one. I just need a different one. And it says um, here, while police were looking into Phoenix disappearance, a theory was um, positioned by uh, private investigator Steve Foster that Phoenix had two birth certificates. So she did. She had two birth certificates. Um, one was under the name Phoenix Colden, and this wasn't because of her. Um, and the other is believed to be Phoenix Reeves, the maiden name of Goldia. When the name Phoenix Reeves was entered into a database, the police found four women. So basically, she had two birth certificates. When she was born, Goldia, her mother, named her Phoenix Reeves after her, like her maiden name. She used her maiden name. But then she changed it to Phoenix Colden after her dad's last name. And that's why she ended up having the two birth certificates if that makes more sense. Um, but it wasn't like she went out and got like a fake one or anything. This was something she had ever since she was born almost, you know, right after she was born. So it says that there was, um, four, four women, all were eliminated, eliminated as possibly being Phoenix, except for one, a Phoenix Reeves who were, was recorded as living in Alaska from January to June of 2012. So right after she disappeared, she disappeared December, 2011, the month after that, this, you know, Phoenix Reeves pops up in Alaska. It says, strangely, this Phoenix has no recorded date of birth, social security number or relatives. When the police went to Alaska to question the neighbors, none of them seemed to remember a woman matching Phoenix's name or just physical description ever living there. Police were left at a dead end. <clears throat> they went up to the house too. I think that the person lived at, and she said she had lived there for the, like the last 25 years. And she had never rented her house out to anybody. I wonder who that person was that answered the door, though. I can't remember if they showed who that was. Yeah. It is real. Yeah, Lisa. I know. I've, I was thinking, when this first came out, I was like, no. And then I'm like, the more I thought about it, I was like, mm, yeah. I do. I, I thought, well, I love my chair back there. Now that I'm reading all those messages, like, you know, I love my blue and I keep saying, I want to go back to the blue chair. It just, it's hard to do the lives because I need like my, all this, you know, but I need to figure it out because I like to be on that blue chair. It makes me like feel, I just feel so comfortable. I'm just like, put my legs up, you know, I need like, I have a stool under here. That's what I need to use the stool. Put my legs up. Uh, so we're going to go through the theories because there's, there's only a few. I mean, you know, there's only a few ways this could go. But um, the first one is going to be, you know, sex or sex, human trafficking, the same difference, <laughs> really. Um, so when Phoenix's case is brought up, one of the most common theories is that Phoenix was trafficked. It's important to note that there um, it's important to note here that contrary to popular belief, people who are trafficked are generally not snatched off the streets by strangers in white vans. Instead, traffickers will deliberately target those who are in vulnerable and in desperate situations and will gradually recruit victims over time. And, you know, that's what I was maybe even possibly thinking. If she was dating this cell phone, Mike, or this Michael B, maybe one of those guys could have, um, groomed her. She was very sheltered. You know, I don't think it would have taken maybe much to, you know, twist her think way of thinking and because she wasn't getting along with her parents because she had to move back in, you know, I, and then, you know, a lot of times once they get you into that life, they'll hold that against you. Well, you can't go home. Cause look what you've done now. Look what, look at all the people you've been with. Look at what you've done. You're dirty. They'll say things to that, like that to the girls to where they don't want to leave. They don't feel like they're worth it. They don't, they feel like their family doesn't want them. They feel like they're, you know, nobody wants, wants them anymore, you know, and, and they do. You think so? Um, and it says, while recruiting methods can be, can vary, trafficking victims can be, um, can be recruited by partners under seemingly innocent circumstances. Having a sheltered or religious upbringing, such as Phoenix's, can also lead or lead to trafficking. People raised in religious parent 
or by religious parents may be ashamed to go home or their traffickers will use the situation as blackmail to prevent victims from leaving. St. Louis is also known as being a hotspot for trafficking cases. According to state rep, Nathan um, Tate, St. Louis is one of the top 20 areas in the country for human trafficking. That's, that's a lot. Um, you know, and then Phoenix ran away would be the second theory. Another theory discussed, um, and that by Delia and Thomas, and that's the people that were um, investigating her case for oxygen, is that she may have run away to start a new life. Thomas claimed the police found evidence which suggests she left willingly and implied some of Phoenix's friends may have known something about it. However, Thomas has also said the theory isn't definite and Phoenix's parents have stated they didn't see any reason for her to have run away. And I don't, I mean, I don't know if you would leave your vehicle like that. And you would take something with you from your home. Like she didn't take a cell phone charger. She didn't take a change of underwear. You know what I mean? I'm sure Gloria, or Goldia knows that exactly how many pairs she had. You know, um, she didn't, she didn't take anything with her. That's, that's the only thing it's, you know. And then the third possibility is foul play. Um, Phoenix's bank accounts and social media had not been, uh, not being touched after she went missing. Her car being found abandoned and her sudden disappearance had been used as evidence that Phoenix was killed the day she left her parents' house. Some people have been suspicious of Michael B., Phoenix's boyfriend. Um, according to cell phone records, Michael and Phoenix called each other multiple times, but after she disappeared, Michael stopped calling her immediately. Kind of like he knew. Michael also claimed while being questioned by law enforcement that he had no memory of what he and Phoenix talked about the day she disappeared, despite having long phone conversation that day. Long conversations, sorry. Multi plural, plural, not singular. Um, so yeah, he stopped calling her, you know, after she disappeared, um, he's calling her, they called each other like 10 times that day or something, you know, like they're on the phone the whole day. And then all of a sudden no phone calls, <laughs> stolen rover toilet paper. No, I haven't seen any, but did I put that? Oh, I, I did do that wrong. I, my spelling was wrong. No, the watch was going to change it back. Okay, we're just going to leave it like that. All right. According to cell phone records, Michael and Phoenix called each other multiple times, but after... Oh, I read that part. Sorry. When talking to law enforcement, Akira stated, Phoenix didn't know how to break up with Michael and begin dating cell phone Mike, giving a motivation for both men. When speaking to police, Mike's ex-girlfriend said he was physically violent towards her more than once, and during an argument over Phoenix said, why are you worrying about someone who's dead? So... They're having, they're him, they're having a conversation. They're arguing. And he says, why are you worrying about someone who's dead? Not who's missing, not who disappeared. Who's dead. So. I'm going to grab my drink real quick. I'm going to uh, mute it. So I don't like hurt your. Yeah. So yeah, he said she's dead now. Like, what do you want? What do you, what do you need? Why, why do you even care? All the red flags. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. So be one of the cool kids and hit that like button. <laughs> Let's sort this out thing out into the algorithm. But it says, however, law enforcement has defended Michael saying he was cooperative with police and has ruled him out as a suspect. Now, I wouldn't be ruling anybody out unless they were at work from to, like, you know, one o'clock, two thirty, between like two thirty when she left the house. So two to midnight or, you know what I mean? You gotta, you can't be like, um, no, I, I just, I don't, I don't know how they could have ruled him out. And they, I feel like the cops haven't done a very good job with this case either. That's just my personal opinion. Maybe they're doing a lot behind the scenes that I don't know about. Um, but when asked about, or when asked about the theory of Phoenix meeting foul play with Fox News, Delia said, could Phoenix have been a victim of foul play? And she says, um, Delia, sorry, absolutely. That was one of the theories we went on. But there's no record of Phoenix or her body ever being recovered. 
And when you look at the time frame of what happened from when Phoenix left her house to the time her car was found was a pretty short time frame. What happened to Phoenix Colden the day she left her house in 2011 remains a mystery. With little evidence, barely any suspects, and unverified witness testimonies, her case may never be solved. However, police keep police are keeping the case open and encourage sorry, anyone who may have information about the case to contact the St. Louis Police Department. Is that all I had? Yeah, that's all I had. Okay. Um, and I thought I had the number, but I guess I don't. Um, I don't have it up there. And the number for the St. Louis Police Department is 314-615-5317. And if for some reason, you know, we got, we get super lucky and Phoenix Cauldron's out there and Phoenix is listening to this tonight. If you ran away or if you left and you're, and you're happy and you're fine, um, you can call and you can tell somebody that you're fine and you're happy and you're, you're not coming home. You don't have to tell anybody where you're at. Just like, just so your parents have like peace of mind. I mean, even if you hate them, you know, you won't, you won't always hate them probably like, I, I just, I just know that her parents really want to know where their, their daughter is. And it's just, that's really sad. So yeah, the cops messed up. I want to try to get the two police reports because there's one, the first report that came out was like five or six pages, but it was missing a page. And then Goldia said there was a second one that came out and it was only three pages and they were dated differently. So one was done in December. One was done in January. So it's just, it's very, very crazy, but yeah, you don't, you know, and if, um, what is the other number? What's the, I wonder what the, um, let's see if I can find this number. Okay. There is also a human trafficking hotline. If you, um, are being held and you are listening to this or someone that knows her, it's in the number there is 1-888-373-7888. So there's help. Or shoot, call me. I'll come pick you up wherever you're at. Um, like this, this case has really um, been one that's got me. I'm just like, where, where could you be? Like the, like her car is, like car is pulled over or it's like found, you know, off the road, kind of door open, nobody inside. If it was a robbery, they would have taken her purse. They would have taken her credit cards and used them. I didn't, I'm not, I wasn't thinking about that. Like they would have taken her credit cards and used them. If somebody robbed her, it would, you know what I mean? They would have done that. They wouldn't have cared. They would just use the cards and then throw them away. Crazy. Okay. You kind of know the area code you do. And then her parents had to um, like sell their home because they're looking for their daughter. Can you imagine? Oh my God. I couldn't even imagine having to sell my home where my daughter knows where she lives, you know? Oh my God, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. They spent all of their money to go because they thought that there was this a possible sighting of her and it wasn't, it was bunk. It was just some guy lying, but they lost their home. They had to sell their home. Imagine your daughter's bedroom. You, you'll never see it again. You know what I mean? Like your, your living room where she played and she played with Barbies where she, you know, she backyard where she did her fencing, you know, lessons. And just, that's, that's sad. And then that's her home. Like, you know, like you never change yourself. You never change your telephone number and you never change your home normally because that's where they go. You, they, that's where parents think anyway, you know, like that's sad. I never thought about like, that just kind of hit me. Like when I was, I was like, man, I know what it's like to like lose a home, like to have a home taken from you. And it's, it's devastating. That's devastating. Um, I didn't get a house lost from me, but, um, my parents ended up losing their home. So I'm going to play this, um, podcast. I put the podcast in the description. They're called crime junkie and it was, um, two ladies and 
it was really interesting listening to them talk about this case today. They came out with this um, just a couple years ago. So this is actually like a newer podcast. Um, and let me share this here with you. And I put, I have some pictures I could post up and stuff as well of Phoenix. Um, and then here at the bottom is the number for, you know, St. Louis police department, crime stoppers, also human nation trafficking hotline, all this stuff. I hope she can hear us. Yeah. Without your home and your kids. Yeah. Jenny. It's like you, man, I mean, I, That's devastating. That's really just, that's really devastating. I wish that they, there was just something to go on. You know, I mean, the, the police are so tight lipped. So I have it wrote down. I, I have so many FOIA requests to do, um, but I'm going to try to do a FOIA on that case, on this case. I'm just going to contact St. Louis police department and be like, what do I need to do? Cause there's so many different divisions. I'm just going to call them instead of trying to figure it out on my, you know, on the internet. And then um, speaking of FOIAs, we do have Chelsea Grimm's, will, um, all of her documents, paperwork, body cam, and all of that stuff will be coming in the next um, couple of days, I would assume. They, I, um, like I paid the fee on Friday and they got back to me like before they were closing. So I guess they probably sent it out today. So we'll probably get it in a, in a couple of few days. Um, so that'll be really interesting too. And I think this is where it started, but. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and play this. If you guys don't mind just hitting the like button, it really will help. And thank you guys all for being here tonight. And this is a really good um, podcast, I thought it was. Why? Look for the locked in low prices tags and enjoy extra safer. And despite all the efforts by her family to push for everyone. Okay. Hi, Crime Junkies. I'm your host, Ashley Flowers. And I'm going to put... And, Brett, and the story I have for you today is about a young... I'm going to put this um, link to their podcast in the... Um, comment section. That way, if anyone wants to listen to it over there, or if you guys want to listen to it again, you will, you'll be able to do that. Hey, the jewel, welcome in. A woman who literally seems to vanish off the face of the earth. And despite all the efforts by her family to bring her home, there seems to be a lack of an official investigation. But the further they look into her disappearance, the more questions they have. This is the story of Phoenix Colden. Goldia Colden knows something bad has happened to her daughter. It is 1.30 in the morning, and her daughter Phoenix is always home by now, but she's not pulling into the driveway. She's not walking through the front door, and the house is silent. Now, one thing you need to know about Goldia is that she is not one to just stand around and wait for something to happen. So as soon as she gets that feeling in her gut that something's wrong, she trusts it. She walks into the bedroom that she shares with her husband, Lawrence, and wakes him up. But Lawrence doesn't share her panic, at least not on the outside. He tries to calm Goldia down, saying Phoenix is going to be home soon. She's fine. Everything's going to be okay. But even though Goldia trusts her husband more than anyone, she can't believe a word he's saying. She knows in her heart that something is wrong. Now, Phoenix is a responsible 23-year-old who knows that while she's living under her parents' roof and attending college, she is not supposed to stay out past 1, 1 1.30 a.m., and she never has until now. So Goldia stays up, watching the clock slowly turn from 1.30 to 2.30 to 3.30, and Phoenix still isn't home. And by the next day, both Goldia and Lawrence are beside themselves with worry, and Goldia decides to call the police. But before she can, Lawrence tells her to just wait. Wait for what? Their kid didn't come home last night. Well, it's not that he doesn't want her to call or that he's not worried, because by this point, he for sure is. Basically, Goldia explains in an episode of Real Talk with Tamara that he was just under the impression that they had to wait between 24 and 48 hours before you could report someone <sighs> missing. The information strikes again. I know. 
But actually, that doesn't happen here because Goldie is like, I don't care if you have to wait. Just a word of advice. If you guys ever have anybody that's missing, go to the police department right away or call and be like, you're going to file a report right now. We're not waiting 48 hours, 24 hours. We're not waiting any hours. Even if it's an adult, I feel like they should still be looking into that. And they make a really good point here in a moment um, about welfare checks. Like you can go do a welfare check on just about anybody. Call a welfare check and they'll go check them. Call in a missing adult. Sorry, they're, they're an adult. I'm calling and I'm reporting our daughter missing. An officer from St. Louis County shows up at their house in the northern part of St. Louis later that day and asks them all the standard questions. Name, physical description, age, all of it. But before the Coldens can even get around to telling the officer what had happened, you know, the important information, he stops them as soon as they tell him her birthday. <sighs> he doesn't think she's missing because she's an adult. That's exactly what he says, just like so many other cases we've covered. But Goldia does not budge. She says, you don't know my daughter, you don't know our family, and this isn't right. So the officer is like, okay, you know what? Let me go run her license plate, make sure that her vehicle, which is this 1998 Chevy Blazer, hasn't shown up anywhere. So he steps out, leaving Goldia and Lawrence waiting with bated breath, thinking back on the day before and the last time that they had seen their daughter, wondering if there were any red flags. But the day before had been entirely normal. It was December 18th, 2011, a Sunday, so Goldia and Phoenix had gone to church in the morning. Jill Cedarstrom reported for Oxygen that they had stopped by the store after that and headed home at around 2 p.m. The last time either of them had seen her had been around 3 p.m. Lawrence was in the living room and Phoenix had walked past him out the front door and sat in her SUV, which actually isn't entirely unusual. Usually she would go sit out there to like talk on the phone to get like a bit of privacy. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. But after a few minutes, Lawrence saw her pull out of the driveway. Again, not really any cause for concern. He just assumed that she was going to go to the store or something. But then she just never came back. When the officer comes back in, he informs the Coltons that he ran her license plate but didn't get a hit. Now, I'm not sure if they're able to file an official missing persons report. But even if they are, it becomes pretty clear that the police aren't going to offer any help. The officer is convinced that she just left on her own and she's eventually just going to show back up. And she hadn't left with, like, a bag of stuff or anything, at least nothing that Lawrence saw, right? Right. The only thing missing is her purse, which makes sense because, again, she drove away like she was going somewhere. Right. But all of her clothes are still there. All of her personal belongings, everything is at the house. And as far as her parents know, like, she has a great life. She's in college. She has a good group of friends. So not only does leaving on her own not make sense for her personality, but there's also no physical evidence to back that up. Mm -hmm. But even though the police aren't much help, the Coldens aren't just going to sit around and wait for Phoenix to come home. They make and distribute their own flyers. They call local hospitals just in case she was in an accident. Goldia even calls every local news station she can think of, begging them to cover Phoenix's case just to get her face out there because she knows how important it is for the public to be looking out for her. But she is essentially ignored. Call after call gets the same response, and no one wants to cover Phoenix's story. That is, except for one woman, a local reporter named Chandrea Thomas, who works for Fox 2. She hears about the Colden struggle to get any coverage for Phoenix, and she pushes to report on the story herself at her news station. Now, she's appalled not only by the police's dismissal of the case, but also just the lack of coverage. I mean, here is a young, successful, hardworking young woman who literally disappears into thin air, and no one is talking about her. But both Chandrea and the Coldens think that they know why. It is because Phoenix is Black. In an article for St. Louis Post-Dispatch by Marlon A. Walker, Goldia says they're able to get some coverage, but nothing close to cases like Natalie Holloway, for instance. But it's not just the media or the police or the institutions they're used to seeing this from. What's wild about Phoenix's case is that it is a grind to even get Phoenix's own friends to help. I mean, Goldia is shocked by how many of Phoenix's friends just kind of drop off and don't seem to care. Uh, yeah, I'm always shocked when I hear stuff like that, too. I mean, I've literally already had you search my house when I thought Justin was missing. For like and... five minutes, like the second you thought he was gone. Yeah. If something happened to you, 
it's like, oh, well, would not be it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, this Crime Junkie feed would just be episodes titled Missing Ashley Flowers. I literally thought about that. If anyone I ever knew went missing, I was like, every audio Chuck show would just become about that case. Now, fortunately, there are a few friends who set up and offer some helpful information. And the Coldens learned that they might not have known their daughter as well as they thought they did. For example, a few days after she went missing, Goldia is kind of doing her thing, making some calls, and she's actually speaking to one of Phoenix's friends. And the friend mentions Phoenix's boyfriend, a boyfriend that Goldia and Lawrence didn't know about. So Goldia is obviously shocked by this, and she asks if the boyfriend would know where Phoenix is. And the friend is like, I mean, yeah, if anybody would, he would. But his friends would. How are they not shouting this from the rooftops on day one? Yeah. Not like, oh, yeah, maybe ask this person she had this significant relationship with. Again, if you go missing, the first episode of Missing Ashley Flowers would just be me being like, Eric did it, right? <laughs> You're like fully feeding into like the husband always did it thing. It's probably not Eric. But I think that this is like the tip of the iceberg of them discovering that they maybe don't know everything about their daughter, right? And I think mm. that maybe goes into her friendships. Maybe the people they thought were her close group of friends aren't. I don't know the full dynamic. Right, right. And I also don't know how exactly this call went down. So maybe there was more urgency, but I don't know. To me, it just seems like someone should have let them know sooner. But this is what I was meaning about these friends, even the ones who are helping. It's just kind of like this, oh, by the way, kind of thing. So anyways, this friend does agree to call the boyfriend and see if he knows anything. And a few days go by before Goldia hears back. Days? Yeah. Where is the urgency? I know, this is painful. But when they finally call back, they say that they talked to the boyfriend and he said he doesn't know anything. I'm sorry, this is all too weird. This is after days have gone by? Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. Yeah, neither is Goldia. So she asked the friend, well, do you believe him? And the friend's like, no, not one bit. I mean, that's all I'd need to hear. Let's go talk to him, see what he knows, yeah. everything. Yeah, well, hold on, because there's more. In these last few days, they have learned even more new information about Phoenix that they have to take into consideration when planning their next move. Like? Like, not only did Phoenix have a boyfriend, the two of them had actually lived together for a while. What? How did her parents not know about him then? Let me give you, I think you need some context around this. So when Phoenix was 18, she had moved into an apartment with who her parents thought was a female friend. Like Goldia had even signed the lease and each time Goldia had been over to the apartment, she had never seen anything that would indicate that there was a guy living there. Do they know how long he was living with her? I don't think so, at least not at this point. But it had been for a while because Phoenix had just moved back in with her parents like earlier that year. Which I can't imagine that transition was painless, going from having all that freedom to living with your parents again. I had to go back to living with my parents when I was exactly Phoenix's age, 23. And it, I mean, it was painful for me. And I have lovely parents, as she might too. And it wasn't the easiest for her. But again, as far as Goldie and Lawrence knew... Things were okay. But the more they're uncovering about Phoenix, the more they start to question literally everything in her life. Because in addition to the boyfriend and the living arrangements before, they also find out that she actually hadn't enrolled in classes for the fall semester. So everything is a lie? Well, that's what they want to find out. It's around this time that they decide to go through her room. I mean, they had been in it since she went missing, but never with the intention of like searching for clues as to not just where she is, but like who she is. Mm -hmm. But when they do this, they find some items that make them start questioning what really happened to their daughter. Never say then. Shaq pizza. But you find one of her boyfriends. Papa John's donates one dollar from every shakaroni sold to the Papa John's Foundation. Pizza gets bigger when you shakaroni. Only at Papa John's. First, they find one of her boyfriend's business cards with his phone number on it. And this is a big deal. Wait, why? I mean, didn't the friend have his number? They called him and talked to him. Here's the thing. So from what I can tell, the friend did have the number. The friend did call him, but the Coldens didn't have his number. So I don't know if the friend, like, 
just didn't think to pass it along, then they couldn't get a hold of them or wouldn't pass it along or what. But from what I can tell, this is the first time that they're seeing his number anywhere. So anyways, this is huge because back in 2011, when you got your phone bill, you could see every number who called you and every number that you called. So they take a look at their phone bill specifically for the last few days before Phoenix went missing. And his number shows up multiple times. The day before she went missing, that was December 17th, they had had a phone call that lasted 116 minutes from 11 p.m. to almost one o'clock in the morning. And then the day she went missing, they had talked twice, once for six minutes and once for just a single minute. And actually, that one minute conversation is the last number that she called on that phone. Could that be the call she took from the driveway? Or is this later, like after she left? Actually, neither. This last call happened an hour before she left the driveway. How is this the last call if it's before the call she made in the driveway? So that's the thing. We actually don't know if she made a call in the driveway. So the thing that her dad said is when she went to her SUV, like he said, it was normal because she would often take calls. Not that he saw her taking a call. So as far as we know, no call necessarily was made. Okay. Are the police aware of any of this? Because if he's the last person she talked to, it seems like he's the person they should be looking at, right? Well, no. I mean, as far as I can tell, the police aren't looking at anyone. So they're definitely not starting with him. Now, the phone records are not the only thing that they find suspicious because tucked into the pages of a notebook in her room, they also find a piece of paper with this hastily scribbled note. Now, they can tell it's written by Phoenix, but from what Goldia can tell, it's seemingly something that someone said to her. Now, I don't know exactly what the note says, like verbatim, or even what it's written on. All I have are like that it's a piece of paper dated for the day she went missing, and I just have this summary that Goldia gave on that episode of Real Talk with Tamara that I mentioned earlier. And what Goldia said on that show was, quote, we think you need to make up your mind about what you're going to do before 2012 or else I'm going to have to show you what I can do about your parents, end quote. Uh, That's a threat. Mm -hmm. That's what Goldia ends up thinking, too. Well, and also, who is we? I have no idea. Again, Goldia is paraphrasing there, not verbatim what the note says. So I don't know if it actually was a we or an I or whatever, but whoever said that clearly wanted Phoenix to make a decision about something. And it does seem like they're threatening her, but her parents don't know what the decision would need to be about. Now, after they find the note, the Coldens keep searching for Phoenix in whatever way they can, but they just keep hitting dead ends. That is until two weeks later when they learn that her car has been found. Where did they finally find it? Well, that's the thing. It has been sitting at an impound lot in East St. Louis since the day she went missing. I'm confused. Same. The police ran her plates the day she went missing. Bingo. Why didn't it show up in their system till now? Well, for a second, you got to slow down because, yes, police ran the plates the day she went missing and they found nothing. But right now, it's actually not the police who find her car. So get this. On January 1st, Goldia gets a call from this family friend. This is somebody who had heard Phoenix is missing, and they basically just are calling to see if what they heard is true. Now, whoever this person is, once Goldia confirms that, yes, my daughter's missing, this family friend says, okay, I'm going to do some digging. And they ask for Phoenix's license plate number, her vehicle description, stuff like that. They hang up, and not 15 minutes later, Goldia gets this call back. And this friend says, Listen, I've tracked down her car to this tow yard in East St. Louis, which is across the Mississippi River from Missouri in Illinois. 15 minutes? It took them 15 minutes to find the car while police have been doing what exactly all this time? And that's the question, isn't it? But regardless of how they learned where it was, what matters now is that they know where it is. So the Coldens pass this information on to the St. Louis County Police, who head to the impound lot and start processing the car. And they do end up learning some pretty disturbing details about how it was found. So it turns out the car was found less than three hours after Phoenix left home at an intersection at around 5.30 p.m. And they're told that it was found 
in the traffic lane with the engine running, keys still in the ignition, with the driver's door just open. Now, the officer who first came upon it said that he didn't see anyone inside. And after confirming that it hadn't been reported, it was just towed away. And as if that wasn't suspicious enough, the area where it was found makes her parents even more worried because Again, it's found in East St. Louis, which is known for violent crime, known for drugs, gang activity. I mean, this is known to not be a great place to be in. So it's not a place that Phoenix would normally go to on her own. Okay, but that's what they know of. I feel like she was doing a bunch of things they didn't know about. True, though. true. And I mean, even if she did take the car there, what I can't get over is they find this car in a bad part of town under clearly suspicious circumstances. And no one was like, maybe we should see whose car this is. And Exactly. That's what I was just getting ready to say. You know, they, they spot her car. I mean, look at the vehicle. It's got the door open. The ignition is on. I mean, um, and you're in East St. Louis. <laughs> uh, you think that you would probably call the owner. And the owner was in Phoenix. The owner of the car was her parents. So if they would have done their job and they would have called her parents and been like, why is your vehicle on the side of the road in East St. Louis? They would have said, well, it's not. Or, it shouldn't be. Oh my gosh, that's our daughter. Like then the ball would have been rolling right then and there. But instead it was two weeks later that they found out about the car. Two weeks of going to sleep for 14 days and waking up for 14 or going to bed for 14 nights and waking up for, you know, 14 days, not knowing where your child is or her vehicle. And then finding out the car has been in the impound lot the whole damn time. Since 530, the same day that your daughter left out the driveway at 230. They found her car three hours later. It's crazy. Find out why it's here in the middle of the road. What? Still on. And this is what is, to me, the strangest part. The car is actually, though it's Phoenix's car, like she's the only one that used it, it's actually registered and insured under Goldie's name, which you think they would have known. So literally all East St. Louis police would have had to do is like pick up the phone and call her. So you got this abandoned car. It seems like there was no effort put in to even track down the owner. Right. And- I still don't understand how the car didn't show up when the St. Louis County police ran the plates when <sighs> Goldia and Lawrence went to them I in the first know. place. I was super hung up on that too. But Goldia says in an article for HuffPost by David Lord that she thinks the East St. Louis police just didn't enter it into their system right when it came into their possession. So by the time St. Louis police ran the plate, it didn't show up. Like just this small window, they basically missed each other. And how much was lost in that, though? Like, even though they're processing the car now, it hasn't been treated like a crime scene for two weeks. Who knows what evidence was in there that might be contaminated mm. or degraded by now? I mean, I think it depends on who you ask, because police would say that nothing was lost in those two weeks, because when the car is finished being processed, the police tell the Coldens that there wasn't anything in it. Like, it was empty, no items, no fingerprints, nothing. I mean, it's so worthless as evidence to them that they just release it to the family on January 5th. So when they release it, Goldie and Lawrence head over to the lot to get it. And I kid you not, as soon as they open the door, the first thing they see are Phoenix's reading glasses, like sitting right there. Bullshit. There's nothing in the mm -hmm. car. And the glasses aren't even all like there's a tote bag. Her purse is there. There's a scarf to short sleeve t-shirts, an extra pair of shoes that she kept in the car. Um, there was a bracelet, some earrings. I mean, her insurance card, the list goes on and on. Now that to me sounds like, a, you know, a young 20 some year old's car. Shoot, I'm 38 and I'd have the same, same items in my car. Because when they said that there was nothing in the vehicle, right then and there, her parents should have been like, what do you mean? You know, um, if they are, no if she's known to have things in her car. I really don't know anybody that don't doesn't have something in their back seat or something in their front seat, you know, just, I don't know. Maybe y'all are a little bit not as messy as me, but I got a blanket. I can tell you right now, I got a blanket in the back seat of the car. It's folded up, but it's still back there. And I think I have some, uh, I got a pillow in the trunk and I got a sleeping bag in the trunk and a tent. 
got it all. So, you know, um, they should have, they should have collected those items and went through them, you know, to make sure that there wasn't anything on them. If all of that is nothing, what is actually Dude, nothing to I, them? Right? I don't know. Okay, so all of this is still in the car, and the police just collect none of it. None of it. Nothing. Which is, this is what I'm saying. Like, to them, they're like, oh, the two weeks, you know. And again, there might have been more. Who, who knows what happened in those two weeks? But they think everything in there is useless. Especially, again, to me, you didn't even look at her purse. Were you even looking at the right car? I'm so confused. Right. But even after all of that frustration and negligence, it seems like the investigation is finally starting to take off. Goldia says in another episode of Real Talk with Tamara that after the car is found, police bring in cadaver dogs to search the area around where it was found. They also check her bank and her phone records, you know, actually starting to investigate Phoenix's disappearance. <sighs> Yeah. And the police confirm that her bank account hasn't been accessed and her phone hasn't been used since she went missing. And there was nothing suspicious from when or where the phone stopped being used? Well, again, so based on the phone bill, we know that last call that she made was that one minute call I mentioned earlier. But police have never said if she was texting on it or anything afterwards. And I couldn't find like, again, where it stopped transmitting or died or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Now, they at this point, also finally interviewed the boyfriend who they end up clearing. So he's a dead end. This is when the Black in Missing Foundation steps in and helps the Coldens get some national coverage for the case. And once Phoenix's name is out there, tips do start coming in. For instance, there is one where someone contacts investigators and says that they think they saw Phoenix at a bus stop there in St. Louis and wouldn't you know it, when they go to check it out, there is surveillance footage. So they take a look, and there is a woman who bears a striking resemblance to Phoenix to the point where investigators think that they found her. So they take some of the images to her parents just to be sure, and they say it wasn't her. But despite that disappointment, the Coldens keep pushing forward. They go on the local news. They keep handing out photos and flyers. They even start a fund to raise money to hire a private investigator. And Lawrence even leads searches of their own around where her car was found. But time after time, they come up with nothing. By the time spring rolls around, they have raised enough money to finally hire that private investigator who gets to work trying to fill in some of the blanks. And he starts with the police report from the officer who found Phoenix's car. He's able to get a copy of it, which he passes on to the Coldens, and they are shocked by what they see. Hey everyone, Britt here. We come across some pretty interesting jobs. Rambra has traveled across. First, the report they get is people who dare to take on these pages. At least that's what you will not believe some of the stories they shared. Listen to Dark Arenas now, about wherever that. you listen to podcasts. We'll be on in just a moment. First, the report they get is supposed to be six pages. At least that's what they think because it's numbered. One, two, three, four, six. Page five is missing, which strikes them as odd. There's also just not a lot of information in the report, like nothing about who the car was registered to and insured by. And finally, on one of the first pages, like there's this line that says victim, where the officer can write if there is someone in the car or around the car, hurt, whatever. And in that line, in that victim line, is written adult female. How would he know that if Phoenix wasn't with the car? Exactly. It is bizarre. And they don't get an explanation for it either. So the report just ends up furthering the... So the... Officer takes a report and says that there is a woman found by the car. But in the second report, that's mysteriously gone. Very, very strange. Very, very strange. And I'm going to try to get both of those police reports. Hopefully they still have the first one. Rick, between the East St. Louis not. PD and the Coldens. Yeah, I'm on the Colden side here. It's not adding up. And if you don't have answers for why, then you're part of the problem. Same. Now, tips are still coming in to both police and the Coldens themselves, and one of them does grab their attention. This man from Texas calls them and says that he knows where Phoenix is. He says she's alive, she's in Texas, and he can point them to exactly where she's staying. 
Now, based on their conversation, the Coldens are convinced that this guy is legit. I mean, he gives them details that seem really convincing. And so they spare no expense traveling to Texas to get their daughter and bring her home. And mind you, already they have spent a lot of money in their search for Phoenix. I mean, their life savings are all but gone. But to them, this is all worth it to get their daughter back. Yeah. But when they travel to Texas, they are devastated to learn that the man they talked to was lying. Phoenix isn't there. And even though that's the most heartbreaking part of this, it doesn't even end there. Because a HuffPost article by David Lohr reports that the trip puts them dangerously close to losing their home. Now, they contact police to try and report this guy and have him arrested. But the authorities tell them that they actually can't do anything. Because he contacted the Coldens and not police, he hasn't hindered their investigation. So apparently there's nothing they can do. <sighs> now, the Coldens are able to end up selling their house, which helps them avoid foreclosure. But their financial situation stays dire, all because this random man wanted attention or I, I don't know, whatever his motive was. <sighs> what is wrong with people? I, I know. I will never understand the reasoning behind shit like that. Yeah. So it is back to square one. So did they ever have any theories about where she is? Like, I know they had the boyfriend theory for a while, but after that was ruled out, what else were they working on? Well, I mean, there's still the theory, I think, in police's mind that she left on her own, which her parents both adamantly deny, especially since she didn't take any of her personal belongings. Mm -hmm. But there is also a second theory that she was met with foul play, specifically that she was abducted and trafficked. Now, if she did leave on her own, would she be savvy enough? Because that's pretty, I'd be pretty savvy to take your car to East St. Louis and leave the door open, leave your purse in the car and leave it running. Because to me, that almost looks like a setup. <laughs> like that's every thief's dream. The cars are running. The keys are in it. You know, you don't have to break into it. You don't have to hotwire it. And it has a purse sitting there with credit cards. I mean, you know, she is very beautiful. And this is this picture here is the one that um, from the video where she was just feeling really, really down. I mean, at this point in 2011, 2012, St. Louis had a massive human trafficking problem. According to a two part documentary titled The Disappearance of Phoenix Colden, St. Louis is one of the top 10 cities for human trafficking in the United States. And Interstate 70, which runs right through it, is known as the sex trafficking superhighway. Oh, my God. And as we all know, there are lots of ways someone can become a victim of human trafficking. But, Britt, I actually had you look up some of the more common ways that people fall victim to this. Can you talk us through what you found? Yeah. So, like you said, there are a lot of tactics to force someone into this. And I know we've talked about before that maybe it's, you know, someone you know who pressures you into sex work, mm -hmm. like a boyfriend, for instance. They say, oh, it's just this one time. We need the cash. You'll never have to do it again. But then it becomes one more time, one more time, and it's never just one more time. Mm -hmm. Another common tactic is that someone will offer you a job that takes you away from home. It might seem like a little too good to be true. And once they get you away from like the safety and the comfort of home, you're forced into it. And then there are abduction scenarios where there's no tricking or manipulation involved. Right. Someone just grabs you. And those are two examples that they give in the documentary about Phoenix's case. And I'll talk more about it later, but they even interview a survivor. And that's exactly what she says. I mean, there are so many ways someone can be lured or forced into trafficking. And the abduction theory is actually what the Coldens start to think happened to Phoenix. Between the location of her SUV and the way it was found, they think it's totally possible that someone just grabbed her mm -hmm. straight out of her vehicle. But what about the note? Who says it can't be both? Like, maybe someone got her into this and maybe she was trying to get out? Mm -hmm. It would explain a lot of the behaviors her parents couldn't, like dropping out of school. Right. I mean, it's totally possible. But again, if we're looking at all scenarios, it's also totally possible that the letter was just a red herring and they aren't connected. I mean, like something definitely was going on that took her to that area and then she was abducted. And I only suggest that because of this story about another young woman that the Coldens learn about. According to that same HuffPost article by David Lore, this woman was at a stoplight a few years ago and a man 
literally just walked up to her car, opened the door, reached over, ripped her from the car, and shoved her into another vehicle. Now, she said there were a few people in the car, and they took her somewhere that she didn't recognize. It was there that she was drugged, repeatedly sexually assaulted, and was basically made aware that they planned to traffic her. Now, thankfully, she was able to get away. Most of the people that she had been with had, I guess, gone out one day, and there was just one guy left to guard her, and he got drunk. So she took that opportunity and just ran to this nearby house where the woman who answered the door called 911 for her. After she was taken to the hospital, she learned that the place she had been taken was about three hours outside of East St. Louis. But she says that pretty much right away, the police didn't seem to care about what she'd gone through. Hmm. They never found the people that had abducted her. And aside from being interviewed at the hospital, the police only contacted her once, like a year later, and she hadn't heard any updates since. So the Coltons have got to be thinking that this woman's ordeal and Phoenix's disappearance are connected, right? Oh, I mean, her family thinks it's a definite possibility, but I'm not sure what the police do with that information. In fact, they stay pretty tight-lipped about everything that they're doing, so I'm not entirely sure what they know or what they do with what they know. Anyways, after this tip from the woman, things seem to go quiet. The Coldens keep their search going with their PI, and if the police ever make any headway, it's never been reported on. But that police report that the PI got has just been nagging at Goldia this whole time. I mean, there are so many things about it that just don't sit right with her, like the missing page, that spot where it said there was a victim. So in the summer of 2013, she goes to the East St. Louis Police Department and requests a copy of the report herself. They give it to her. And she is appalled to see that what they gave her is a completely different report than what she saw a year ago. What? Yeah, this one is three pages, not six. The date that it was filed isn't December 18th when the car was found. It's January 1st, 2012. And Goldia says that it has a lot more information than the first report did. Like the first report didn't have anything about her registration information, which remember was in Goldia's name. And this report has all of it. So there are two reports or just this one? And now they're saying the other one Girl, doesn't exist. I have no idea. I can't find any explanation from the East St. Louis police on why the documents are different. And if the Coldens have ever been told why, they've never made a public statement about it. But what they're really hung up on is the date that this second report says it was filed. Because... January 1st is the day that that family friend was able to track down the car. Right. And if it wasn't entered into any databases until the 1st, that backs up Goldie's assumption mm -hmm. that they just hadn't filed anything in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So when the officer ran her plate back when she was first reported missing, there's no reason it would have shown up. Right. And which is just another example of how the police's incompetence at the start of this investigation may have severely hindered the entire thing. So over the next few years, the investigation seems to stall. I mean, there are a few sightings which make the Coldens believe that Phoenix is still out there. The most convincing, which comes in March of 2014, basically one of Phoenix's former church friends is on a plane coming back from Vegas when she looks up and sees this group of women who are like still boarding. And among them is a woman that she is convinced is Phoenix. She says she's well-dressed. She's with this group of other well-dressed women, as well as these two large, muscular men who look to be about 35 to 40. So when this church friend sees her, she says her name out loud, almost like out of shock. And the woman that she thinks is Phoenix turns to her, looks her dead in the eye, and she says something like, oh, do I look like someone? And so the church friend kind of goes on to explain, you know, you look like my friend Phoenix. And the woman just doesn't even respond. She just keeps walking past her to her seat. Now, as soon as the plane lands, the church friend goes to the airport officials to report what she saw. And police end up being called. And they search the entire airport. But they're never able to track this woman down or even confirm if it really was Phoenix. You know, I feel like this fits with the trafficking theory. I mean, if she's traveling with a group, including mm -hmm. these two men. I mean, it's suspicious, right? And like the fact that it's this church friend 
to me, like, it feels a little less random. Like, I don't think they would have mistaken her identity. Like, they'd known each other for years. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, it just seems so legit. It seems to carry more weight for some reason. Yeah. Now, after this sighting, Goldia and Lawrence keep trying to push to get Phoenix's case solved. But as the years pass, it seems like everyone has forgotten about Phoenix. Everyone but Chandrea Thomas, that reporter I mentioned earlier. She's actually never forgotten about the Coldens and the search for their daughter, even though reporting on her case has all but stopped. So she actually starts working with Oxygen True Crime to produce that documentary on Phoenix's case that I've talked about. She teams up with this man named Joe Delia, who's worked for the FBI, the DEA, and he was actually part of a task force that busted one of the largest child sex trafficking rings in the U.S., The two of them together start digging into Phoenix's past for this documentary, and slowly but surely, they start to unearth even more information that had never been made public before. Hey everyone, Britt here. We come across some pretty interesting jobs researching cases for Crime Junkie episodes, but have you ever thought about this with the people who found in the SU on these dark jobs, and you will not believe some of the stories they shared? Listen to Dark Arenas now, wherever you listen to podcasts. For example, one of the things found in the SUV was a phone bill. But it wasn't for the family plan. It turns out that Phoenix had a phone other than the one on the Colden's family plan. Did her parents know about it? Not until after she vanished. And they knew it for a long time, but it was something that they just kept under wraps, probably to try and protect the investigation. But I mean, with so many years at this point having passed, I think they felt like they had nothing to lose by including it in the doc. Now, Chandrea and former officer Delia confirm with the St. Louis County Police that they have been able to track her phones, both of them, on the day she disappeared, but they won't share what those records told them. Okay, but do they know why she had two phones? If anyone, police, Coldens, anyone know, no one says. But Chandrea and Officer Delia talked to some of Phoenix's friends, and they say that it was because she didn't want her mom or her boyfriend to know that she was talking to this other guy. Apparently it was a guy that she was dating while she was with her boyfriend that she lived with for a time, though I'm not sure, like, how much of an overlap there was. But either way, Chandrea and Officer Delia dive into this guy's background and they dig up some pretty interesting stuff. So boyfriend number two has a restraining order against him from a girlfriend that he had up until the end of 2011. Chandrea and Officer Delia track her down and they talk to this other woman. And in the documentary, she says that boyfriend number two, he was possessive and angry and over time became both emotionally and physically abusive. Mm. But that's not all. She also says that he was obsessed with missing persons cases, specifically Phoenix's and a few others in Chicago. Now, he told her it was because he was a psych major and just really into true crime. And fair, listen, I'm also obsessed with missing persons cases. Right, we're all here, right? But she pressed him further and he asked her why she was so worried about someone who was already dead. I'm sorry, what? Yes, super sus. Well, when Chandrea and Officer Delia go talk to him, they learn that he has a lawyer and isn't up for talking. Like He's not saying anything. But they know that the police are at least aware of him, so there's not much more they can do on that front. Now, one of the other major discoveries comes when they talk to the officer who first saw Phoenix's SUV the evening she went missing. Now, remember, the Coldens were told, really, Everyone was told that the SUV was parked, door open, keys in the ignition, engine still running. But when they speak to this guy, again, who is listed as a responding officer, he's like, no, door was closed, SUV was off, keys were not anywhere in the vehicle. So the complete opposite of what they've been saying for years. I have no idea how this story got so twisted. Again, this is years later. I don't know if he's misremembering because even on the police report that the Coldens have, it's literally written that the car is still running and the door was open, all of it. Okay, here's my question. Do the investigators have the keys then? We know the Coldens don't have them. 
if the police didn't collect them when the car was found, mm -hmm. that would confirm, that would mean the story everyone's been believing for years is wrong. Right. There's so many pieces that are missing. I don't know who has the keys because you're right. If the investigators have them, I mean, they're keeping it under wrap. Right. And to your point, like if they have them, then the keys were with the vehicle. It just doesn't make any sense. None of this case makes any sense. So I have to keep going. The next thing that the doc reveals is another big twist. So they reveal this video from one of Phoenix's cell phones. Apparently, the video was taken about a month before she disappeared. And in it, she is talking to herself about wanting to start over. She basically says that she's gotten herself into a situation. And while she doesn't go into any detail, she's looking around like there's something or someone watching her. Uh, I feel like that would have been important to know day one. Mm -hmm. This plus the note in her room really makes it seem like she was trying to get away on her own. Yeah. But something about this, I don't know, it still feels like there's got to be a foul play element. You said she's like looking around in the video. It feels like she's clearly running from someone, right? Again, her parents are still adamant that she didn't leave on her own. But there are actually a few reasons that kind of back up that theory. Her friends tell Chandrea and Officer Delia that Goldia and Lawrence are pretty strict and that ever since she moved home, she had been having a really rough time getting used to not having that freedom that she had in the past. But it goes beyond that. One of her friends mentions getting in an argument with Phoenix a few days before she disappeared, in which Phoenix threatened to pack and leave. Okay, what if it's all of it? Like, she could have run away, but also have been trafficked if whoever she ran away to was shady. I really think trafficking could be involved in some way. And, I mean, again, to go back to even what I was saying, maybe that was happening before. Maybe that's the thing that made her want to leave. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the ideas that Chandrea and Officer Delia explore in the doc is that traffickers can hold something basically, quote unquote, shameful over someone to force that person into it. So maybe she had done something that she felt her parents wouldn't approve of, or again, she just felt a lot of shame over whether she should have or not. And whoever she was with knew that and used that against her. Though, I will say that the Colin's P.I doesn't really buy into that theory. As far as I can tell, he doesn't work for them anymore. And he tells Chandrea and Officer Delia that after everything he's learned, he thinks Phoenix ran away on her own. He says the human trafficking theory is unlikely because she had a support system around her. Even if her parents were strict, she had friends. Now, could she have gotten lured away by something? Maybe. But he says that he's pretty convinced she left on her own to start a new life. Listen, if he has proof she did this on her own, by her own choosing, awesome. Great. Let's see it. But, Ashley, people with support systems get trafficked all the time. I totally agree with you. This felt like a very old school mindset yeah. about trafficking. And again, I don't want what he's saying to get like misinterpreted. I think this is some toxic misinformation that makes it so hard for people to spot trafficking. Because again, we've said it before, it happens to people with great support systems. Sometimes those people go home to their families. Well, and on top of that, this is not like way back in the day. Yes. She went missing in 2011. It is not that easy just to yeah. disappear into thin air. Well, actually, it's funny you should say that because for Phoenix, it actually might have been easier than for most people. Because in researching this case, I found out that she had two birth certificates. Okay, what are the odds of that, though? Why? I know. So the first one is from when she was born, and it has her mother's maiden name on it, which was Reeves. And then when Goldia married Lawrence and Phoenix was still a child, she changed it. But the Reeves birth certificate still exists. And theoretically she could maybe use it to assume a new identity. So Chandrea and Officer Delia, they found this out as well. They decided to look into that idea just in case. And it might actually have some legs to it. They start looking into that name and they find four people going by the name Phoenix Reeves. Three can be discounted right away because they're able to determine that they're not Phoenix, or at least they're not the Phoenix they're looking for, right? But the fourth is interesting. They can't find a social security number for that name, no relatives, nothing. But there's records of someone going by the name Phoenix Reeves because it was associated with a place in Anchorage, Alaska from 
January of 2012 to June of 2012. Which is right after Phoenix Colden went missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the documentary follows Officer Delia as he actually goes to Alaska to see if he can track down this Phoenix. But as good of a lead as it seemed, he can't find her. I mean, he goes to the address, but the woman who lives there says that she's lived at the house since 2002. She's never rented to anyone. No one in the neighborhood recognizes Phoenix photo either. So, I mean, this was promising, but it's like every other sighting. It seems like a dead end. Is there any other theory about where she could be? Any similar cases? Anything? The only other possible connection is the murder of a woman named Stacy English, which happened in Atlanta back in December of 2011. And Stacy's story goes that she'd gone missing after a family gathering and her car was found the exact same way as Phoenix's was, or at least how we thought it was in the beginning, right? Like door unlocked, engine running. Anyway, Stacy's body was found on January 23rd of 2012 under a tree about a mile from her car. And while her death was eventually ruled as quote unquote accidental, her family disagreed with the ruling. But that's really it. Over the last few years, there haven't been any possible sightings, at least none that have been reported on. But Goldia and Lawrence are still desperate for their daughter to come home. So... Phoenix, if you are out there somewhere and you happen to hear this, maybe you did leave on your own. You don't have to come back to your old life. I mean, you'd be 34 years old now. You can make your own decisions, but your parents are desperate to know what happened to you. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to tell anyone where you are. There are ways to keep your location and identity secure, but they do miss you and they do love you. But if you didn't mean for this to happen, if you maybe trusted the wrong person or did something you aren't proud of, something that you think people will judge you for, there are resources out there that can help you get out of whatever situation you're in. You can call the Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888 for anonymous immediate assistance. And that applies to anyone who feels like they might be in that situation. And if Phoenix isn't out there, or if this never makes it to her, then Crime Junkies Finding Phoenix is up to you. If any of you know anything about the disappearance of Phoenix Colden, you can call the St. Louis County Police at 636-529-8210. Or you can submit a tip online to the St. Louis Regional Crime Stoppers at stlrcs.org. Okay, so that was the podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yes, prayers. Prayers for Phoenix and her family. And I I, I can't I can't imagine being her family, her mom and dad. Um, you know, one minute your daughter is sitting in the driveway. Um you think she's talking on the phone to a friend or whatever, you know, she's just in her car doing something that she does all the time. And then you turn around and she's gone. And that's like, I mean, people don't just disappear. It's, it's so crazy to me. Missing persons cases really get me like, I know, like, I mean, true crime gets me in general, like, you know, but when it comes to missing it, there's just, there's so many questions. There's, there's so many more questions than if it's like a murder, let's say, because, you know, usually we will find a suspect and then we have like a trial and we have something going. But when is someone missing or they just, someone just disappeared? Like there's just so many questions, you know, and I can't imagine going to sleep every night when, and you know, you know, you know, her parents still do. They probably go to bed every night and they probably say, you know, wonder where she's at. Like, because even, uh, even if it was a, like a, a killing. That's like, like someone robbed her, you know, like they wanted her car. So they like, you know, did something to her for her vehicle or something. You would think that she would be found in that general area by somebody by now. Or like in an old um, like home or, you know, how like people will sometimes like unalive somebody and they'll throw them in like a abandoned home. But none of that's n nothing. 
nothing at all. I think that I'm going to, I put, I wrote it down on my FOIA, my FOIA request sheet. I'm going to try to get like a FOIA request for this. I'm going to try to get them to give me anything that they have on it. I know they've been like really tight lipped with um, like releasing anything, which is kind of to me in a missing person case, you need to be releasing everything pretty much. I mean, unless it's like something, you know, that you need to keep in, but you need transparency because people need to know. So um, that is all for our, did I, did he? Oh, that's so sad, Aggie. Oh, that's sad. So just her mama. Man, her mom's a strong force. When I first, when I first um, came into this, like when I first saw it, I was real hard on her mom. And then I, I don't know tonight I, when I saw, I was listening to her mom on a different, like um, not this podcast, but a different like thing she was on. And I was just like, man, she's just the mom. She's mom hurting, wanting her child back. I mean, even if she was the strictest parent in the world, doesn't mean your child should be taken from you. And she was only 23. I mean, I know you're an adult at 23, but like, are you really? Are you really? You know, I feel like, I feel like you are, but you're not, you know, at the same time. So, well, thank you. Be happy for the super sticker. Look at that. I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome in. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, that all, that's all that we have for tonight. I wanted to let you guys know tomorrow I may not be on for our live. Um, it's Vincent's birthday tomorrow. So just depending on what we're doing, I'm going to do something nice for him while he's at work. So, um, and then his mom sent him a bunch of snacks. <laughs> you think she died the day she went missing? Um, I just don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, the trafficking... I don't know. I would think that you would, there would be like a sighting of her, you know, um, something. I just, I just hope that this isn't, I hope we're not here in 13 years with like Chelsea Grimm or something, you know, another, the other missing person case we're covering. So yeah, I, I'm going to put a, up a community post tomorrow and then I'll tell him that you guys all said happy birthday to him. He's going to be 35 tomorrow. I'm, I'm older than him a few years, but Yeah. I'm like, the old man, I keep calling him that. <laughs> I'm like, the old man, the old man. But um, his mom sent him like some chocolates and some snacks, some like Japanese snacks. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. So I'll, I'll put him in his little cabinet tomorrow for him. <laughs> and then I'm going to, I don't know. I didn't know what to get him. I don't know what to get the guy. The guy doesn't want for nothing. He really doesn't. He's like shoes, you know, shoes. It's really, <laughs> that's really it. Like, I'm like, but Christmas is right around the corner too. I hate that his birthday's in, I really hate that it's so close to Christmas. Like I wish, cause my birthday's in October. I feel like we're like all in like the same kind of group of months. Like it, October, November, December, January, like that's when we're kind of busy. And then, you know, the rest of the year, we really don't have a whole lot to going on. So I wish he had, he had like a summer birthday or I did, one of us did, but um, we're going to celebrate tomorrow. We usually, um, we don't usually do too much for his birthday. Like we have a plan for mine. Like we have, we do the same thing. We eat the same place. We do the same thing, but I think we'll um, just hang out here. I might try to make him something tomorrow for dinner. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Like maybe it's something Jap Japanese for him. His mom already did Holly. She got him the Ferrero Rocher. I just got some like a month ago and I got him at, I got the big thing at Target and we went through those because, yes, we love those. And then his mom got him, like, the Costco version. I was like, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a picture of them, Holly. I'll put it on the community tab. I'm like, what are we going to eat? I was like, these are so a lot of chocolates. She'll, normally, she sent us last time C's chocolates. It's a um, chocolate place in California. Oh, so good. So good. So, so, so good. Um, but she sent the Ferrero Rocher this time. Is that what you got? The Costco version? Yeah. She sent the cost. I was like, that thing's huge. But thank you guys all for telling him happy birthday. He'll love that. He will. He'll love that. He doesn't usually, um, I don't think anyone really knows when it's his birthday because he doesn't usually say too much. Hopefully the guys at work will say something to him. No, his boss will. They'll know. Um, they're great to him. So I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Um, thank you again. Be happy for the super sticker. And thanks for everybody for becoming members. And Brandy Wine, she's been a member for uh, four months. I'm so 12 months, four months. And I hope you guys are all feeling better. I know some of you guys had some headaches and stuff. So 
Thank you, Aggie. We try to be, we try to be beautiful people here. And thank you guys all for coming. I know like a lot of people were like Phoenix who, you know, and the, it really means a lot to me. And I think we'll, we might make this a Monday thing. You know, I really am interested in missing person cases and we have a ton a ton to cover. And I heard that there, this was older statistics, but 600,000 people go missing in the U S every year, 600,000. And we only get a tiny of those through YouTube, a couple, maybe a couple cases a year, you know, that are like big that are missing, like maybe it's just insane. So I think we could, we could probably work on that. So thank you guys all for being here. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good evening. Or if I don't see you tomorrow, I'll see you the next day. <laughs> Bye guys.